Virtual member of the IAG. 
Gary Rich, my wife Kara, we're residents of one long time. Karthik Shah, I'm with the planning from uh, Canon Design here in Boston. Great. Tom Gattasotis from the Office of Representative Jamie Wilson. I'm Alice Navarro, I'm with the Coast. Jamie McNeil, local 26, the hotel work as usual. Lauren Shirtleff, Gary and Lane. So, Nancy Schweiget. Jim Green, Project Council. Matt Conti, North End Florida Firm. Alex Lappin, HYM. John Hurley, HYM. Utah, Mike, Washington, uh, President of Boston, Mr. President. Thank you, Mike. Greenway and member of the IHA. So welcome, everybody. So um, I'm going to run through a presentation. The presentation will take, uh, you know, maybe 15 minutes or so, and then we'll go through a number of questions. And I'm, I'm happy to stay here for as long as you like to answer as many questions as you might have. So uh, we're talking about this property. Obviously, this is the uh, uh, the garage uh, here in all of its splendor. Um, okay. So uh, just quickly, you know, we, we put up a slide or two on the number of meetings. Um, John discussed the, the fact that we've, we've met a number of different times. We started on June the 5th with a, a project notification submission. We've done a, a series of meetings both uh, to the IHE as well as public meetings. Uh, we've been in the West End. Uh, we've been uh, to the uh, Beacon Hill Civic uh, uh, Community we, uh, Civic Group. We've been to uh, the North End. We've been uh, to a variety of different individual neighborhood groups. We've met with uh, small groups of people. We've met with groups who are interested in the, uh, in the Greenway, at the North End Parks. We've, we've done a variety of meetings, and we feel uh, as if the, the project as it has emerged today is in large part as a, as a result, kind of results from the comments and things that we've received from people during the course of those meetings. So we're really pleased to present again today uh, kind of where we are on the project. Um, just to amplify what, uh, what John said earlier about where we are in the process, so at this point, we are in the midst of a comment period for uh, the draft project impact report that we filed, as well as for the uh, plan development area uh, document that we filed as well. Uh, just a word on what these two are. The PDA, or the plan development area, is essentially a special zoning district, an overlay district that's created. This is used frequently, not only in Boston, but in a variety of cities and towns um, across the country as a mechanism that allows for a project to be considered in terms of its dimensional criteria for building high density, open space, wind and shadow impacts, a variety of impacts like that, and allows uh, projects like this to, to move forward uh, of a certain size. The DPIR is sort of a technical analysis of those particular impacts, so wind, water, shadow, all those sorts of things. And the DPIR uh, uh, plays a different role in analyzing the, the specific and technical, technological uh, expect, uh, effects of a, of a project. Um, here's where we are in terms of dates and process themselves. So the DPIR in this column, uh, the purpose of that, as I said, is the technical analysis of, uh, of the project. Uh, the PDA is essentially the zoning that will form it, uh, the zoning for uh, for the project as we move forward when this process is completed. We submitted the DPIR on August 23rd. We submitted the PDA development plan on the 13th of September. The comment period for the DPIR is longer, it runs 75 days. The comment period for the PDA is 45 days. So the two of them have, if you run those out specifically, have two different end dates. But as John suggested, we're already uh, agreeing to move this October 28th date to November the 6th. So that uh, will put us so that uh, both days will, uh, uh, both of these comment periods will end on the same day on November the 6th. Um, the documents, while they serve different purposes, the subject matter is the same in both of them. So this, this really just shows you that for the DPAR, these are the individual building designations. So West Parcel B1, we have this up. I'm going to run through this in a second with everybody. But the building heights are the same. Uh, all of those uh, pieces are the same. The building uses are the same. The total gross square footage to be developed is the same. The parking spaces is the same. The phasing, which is a big part of what we'll talk about, which we have talked about, uh, is the same. So 
uh, it's really the same between the two different documents. They just, the documents themselves, as I said, serve uh, two different purposes. So here's the height and massing as submitted in the DPIR and the PDA. Um, so let me just run through this again. Uh, and we have another slide that, that talks, talks through the differences. The height of the office building, which is on this side of the west parcel, is 528 as filed. Uh, 480 feet for the residential building. You recall that this is the first building that will be building. 299 feet for the second residential building on the west parcel, which is here, that encloses the garage. And then on the east parcel, we brought down the height of the hotel and residential building uh, to be 157 feet here, 152 feet for the small office building here, 60 feet for the small uh, retail building uh, here. So here's what it begins to look like in its complete state, together with um, uh, the roofs as completed and the beginnings of what the design of the buildings might start to look like as, as well. So here's, uh, to recap, the changes that we made in response to a lot of the community work that, uh, that we've done over the last however many months since, uh, since the beginning of the summer. Uh, what we originally filed was a project notification form in keeping with the Greenway guidelines that the BRA had published approximately two years ago, uh, with the, the office building at 600 feet, the residential building at 470, uh, and 275 for this residential building, 275 for this residential building, the two of them kind of matching one another. Um, and we also had, uh, in this uh, uh, project notification form, also presented a different phasing, which I'll run through in, in one second. Um, what you see is we brought down the office building significantly, uh, particularly in comments uh, that we received from uh, members of the West End community uh, and the Beacon Hill community. So we brought that down uh, significantly. Uh, and we brought down the, the height of the building at the uh, pinnacle of the, of the Bullfinch Triangle here. Uh, brought that down 118 feet, again, a significant reduction in height, in large part in, in response to the comments from the BRA staff. And then, in part, to make sure that the, um, that the mixed-use character and the residential character of the, the site was even further enhanced, uh, we were encouraged to increase slightly some of the heights of these residential buildings and this small office building here as well, so that the completed presentation, similar to what I had just presented in the previous slide, is 528 for the, the commercial office building, 480 for the residential building on this side, 299 for the residential building on this side, 157 for this uh, hotel and residential building, and 152 for the office building here, and 60 feet there for the uh, retail building at the, at the base of the East Parcel. So one of the key uh, changes we made was the change in phasing, um, and this is something that we feel really good about. It offers a lot of flexibility for the project as it moves forward. So again, to recap on the phasing, Here's the garage that exists as it exists today. Uh, and we have begun uh, and released the architects to do the work, uh, to begin to design the work necessary for, the, um, uh, for the, uh, the reconfiguration of the interior ramps in the garage so that that project can start to move forward, which allows us to be in position to begin this project as quickly as possible. Again, we felt uh, really good about this process, and so we released uh, the CBT uh, folks, the architects, to begin the process of uh, uh, beginning to design this building at a higher level so that we can move forward on that as quickly as we can, as we've said. So uh, we would build this building first. This is a residential building, approximately 480 feet tall. Uh, this is the building here. And most importantly, what we've uh, also committed to is that once we've completed this building, that the next big phase would be that the garage over Congress Street and out over the East Parcel would come down. That's a, that's a key thing. And people will remember that this building will be built uh, over and through the existing garage so that the garage continues to operate during the course of, of this process. And in fact, we'll continue to operate uh, here because we will have reconfigured the ramps and made, the, uh, made all that work well. Uh, then there uh, is the opportunity for us to build this office building here on this corner where the, the circular ramp is today. Uh, it is also possible, by the way, that we could build this east uh, parcel piece first uh, before we, we build the office building. We show the office building in space 2B and the east parcel is phase 3A. Uh, and then phase 3B is the completion of the surrounding of the remaining garage with this residential building here on, on this side. So that you recall in the, in, the, in the completed piece, the garage itself is totally surrounded and disappears from view. Uh, and the east parcel is created as a terrific retail and, and pedestrian uh, zone that connects uh, from a planning perspective to Canal Street and, uh, and really reconfigures this entire area, something that we're really excited about. In addition to that, um, we spent a lot of time with people who wanted us to ensure that, uh, that the area of the bus waiting uh, spot would, uh, would be widened a bit. So we worked to increase the area for 
uh, uh, for people who are waiting uh, for the buses. And in addition to that, we've increased the width of the plaza here uh, to 85 feet wide, which we think really makes this a, a terrific public plaza. And what this area gives us is a chance to use the, the rebuilding of the, the head house here for the Orange Line and Green Line Station uh, here at Haymarket uh, to make this a bus station that really does encompass um, the, the train station here and has it working together with the bus station so that we can light up that, uh, that head house for the train station, make sure that people understand the timing of when the buses are arriving, trains are arriving, things like that, uh, and really make this a transportation hub that works very well together, which, we, which it really does not do today. So we're excited about that, uh, together with the increased width of the plaza itself, which makes this, as we say, a, a really wonderful public space uh, right in, a, in the midst of downtown Boston. Traffic impacts, we talked, uh, we've talked extensively about this, and I want to just run through it uh, one more time. You recall that the premise of this project is that the amount of density that is to be built here is appropriate because it's right at the heart of all of the transportation improvements that have been made in downtown Boston over the last 15 or 20 years. So uh, the creation of the Big Dig produced all of the ramps here on the 93 interchange right in front of our building. In addition to that, the creation of the Orange Line, uh, which certainly is not a recent project, although for many of us, it, I guess it probably is, right? It's uh, within the last 20, 25 years. Um, the, uh, the Green Line, which has been heavily invested in, is about to receive another investment in the extension out to, uh, uh, out to Tufts University. All of those pieces, all of that um, uh, transportation infrastructure exists right here at the front door. So uh, the, this project uh, seeks to take advantage of all that. So what you'll find is uh, traffic impacts, uh, the over, well over 50% of the, of the uh, car trips will originate and, uh, and you know, come to and from the 93 interchange right here where these ramps are. Uh, so that for Sewer Drive and some of the uh, other uh, pieces here on, on Cambridge Street, there's really a very slight increase in traffic um, as a result of the project. So really only five uh, or three percent in terms of uh, increased traffic on, on Cambridge Street uh, getting to, uh, uh, to Storo Drive. Um, same is true for vehicular trip uh, distribution on exit. Uh, same kind of uh, distribution with by far over 50% of the uh, vehicle trips uh, going on to 93 or coming off of 93. Revised shadow impacts. So the reduction in the height of the office building has also allowed us to uh, examine the reduced shadow impacts one of the most significant ones for us is the reduction of shadow uh, on the summer solstice on June 21st. So uh, kind of hard if you're sitting in the back, but, but here is the North End Park uh, right here in front of, um, uh, or to the, just to the south of our project. Um, and this yellow is the reduction of shadow with the reduction of height from our building. Uh, and as you can see, there's well over a 50% reduction of, of, uh, of shadow on the park. And I do, again, want to just point out for people that shadow is, a, is, a, is not a static thing. Um, a shadow moves across on a, uh, you know, obviously minute by minute basis, moves across these parks. But really the maximum shadow, which is what we're looking at here, is reduced by a significant amount as a result of the reduction in height of, of the building. So we've been pleased with that. And of course, that's been uh, met with a lot of pleased, uh, pleased comments from folks, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in our, our neighborhoods that surround our project. In addition to that, in the winter solstice, solstice uh, here, December 21st, uh, um, there was previously, with the height of this building, there was some shadow on Boston Harbor. This extended over the Coast Guard Station. So that shadow has been reduced, in fact, basically eliminated off of Boston Harbor. You can see that in the winter, there's already a significant amount of shadow that, uh, that extends across the city. Um, and the shadow that you see here from our building in the light blue is new shadow on the roofs of existing buildings. Um, uh, the dark blue shadow, which really doesn't exist here, would be new shadow on streets or parks or uh, existing uh, pedestrian corridors. So really all this is is new shadow on the roofs of existing buildings uh, today. In addition to that, so here's uh, in the morning on December 20, uh, 21st. So the darker blue, as you can see, is shadow that falls for the most part on some of the streets uh, here. The lighter blue uh, is shadow that falls on the roofs of existing buildings. Uh, Morning. And you can also see, obviously, that there's a significant amount of shadow in the morning and the winter as well. Uh, at noon, the shadow falls for the most part on the roofs of existing commercial buildings uh, here, as you can see. And then at, at three, similar to what I just uh, suggested again, 
uh, the shadow is for the most part falling on the roofs of existing both commercial and residential buildings in the world. On uh, March 21st in the morning, uh, the shadow uh, uh, falls uh, on Merrimack Street uh, here, uh, and then there is some new shadow on uh, the Pearl Building uh, here in the, uh, uh, the state complex. Uh, again, but that's new shadow on the roofs of existing buildings. That's on March 21st in the morning. Here it is at noon time. For the most part, this is shadow that falls across uh, Merrimack Street uh, and uh, New Chardon Street. And then here it is at, at 3 p.m. Similarly, uh, for the most part, it's shadow that falls on New Chardon Street and, uh, and Merrimack Street. Here's June 21st in the morning. Uh, the shadow, for the most part, falls on New Chardon Street uh, here uh, and, uh, uh, and a little bit on, on Merrimack Street as well. And then June 21st at noon, uh, uh, a little bit on Merrimack Street, a little bit on the Nishard Street intersection as well. And then here it is at 3 o'clock. For the most part, the shadow falls on the project itself on the east uh, parcel. Here's uh, June 21st at 5. Uh, it has not yet made it to the, um, uh, to the North End Parks, as, as we said, but, uh, but that will happen a little bit later. I showed that slide in the very beginning of this sequence. Uh, but here it falls, for the most part, on the project or on New Sudbury Street. East Parcel Plaza, so we spent a good bit more time internally trying, starting to think about the uh, landscaping for the East Parcel Plaza. This is something that uh, we really see as a, a key change for the whole area. So we've spent a significant amount of time now trying to think through what the public ground plan would look like for the East Plaza. So as people have noted uh, previously, and I, I apologize, this, this might, the lighting of this might not uh, come up as well in, in a well-lit room like this, but the, but the pink here, you recall, is um, uh, or, or salmon colored, I guess I call it, is uh, retail. Uh, so this is all retail, and we want this to be very active retail. A lot of opportunities for people to eat outside, to uh, really enjoy the plaza. And then we're beginning to think about, particularly with the wider plaza, how we'll think through uh, the trees that will be planted, uh, and what the landscaping will look like, and specifically what the uh, revised headhouse will start to look like as well. Again, we really think this is going to be an exciting area. And what we've been encouraged to do by the city and by a variety of you in this room is, is to think about the boundaries of our, our uh, project not being simply uh, this, this plaza, but also the streets like New Shard Street, New Sudbury, uh, and how all these pieces will come together and how these intersections and these roadway <coughs> interchanges can really be improved. That's a, that's a key thing for us as well. So we want to make sure that, that the East Parcel becomes something really special and that the crossings that, uh, that, uh, that people can enjoy in the future can be uh, something that's totally different than what's uh, there today, which is really not, as people know, uh, very pedestrian friendly. Here's a, a closer view of, of what that will look like uh, here. And as, as we said, we've engaged Landworks as part of our, our team with CBT. Landworks is a, a studio that we've uh, used on other projects and, and like their work quite a bit. So we've engaged with Landworks to start the process of, of really thinking this through and, uh, and how it will be, uh, again, a wonderful space. I think that's our oh, coming up on the list. So here's our precedence of where where we are uh, in terms of the kinds of things that we want to kinds of uh, 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 feels that we, the feel that we want the space to have as we move forward on the East Parcel. So here's some ideas of, of different places. Obviously, this is Fayetteville Hall, but there are other places around the world that uh, that we're examining as well. Uh, we want it to be a very active space. We certainly committed to having a highway station early in our, our phasing. Uh, and on the completed project, we'll, we'll probably have two uh, highway stations as well. But very active place. Uh, with this kid jumping on whatever that is, a big pillow or something like that, I'm not sure he comes along with it. Here's what the rendering uh, begins to look like on that east parcel. So again, we want it to be very active uh, and a great space for people to, uh, to walk through rather than <coughs> avoid as they do today. Here's what it starts to look like at night, which we're really excited about. And here again is what it is in, uh, in the completed sense. Or less legend. Yeah. So I'm happy to take questions from anybody. Um, and, uh, okay. um, Tom, in one of the meetings you mentioned, we talked about how to mitigate uh, skateboarders, bicyclists from coming riding right through the plaza. Yep. And I was wondering if there any more thoughts on that. And also, I know that the same hall, we entered from, I don't know, I can't remember the name of the street, that was right there next to the A market. North Street? I mean, North Street? Um, North Street is, it's right where Gordon is supposed to be on that corner. North Street is, is where the Bostonian is, right? So yeah, that was on the other side? Yeah. Over by uh, the back of State Street, whatever that, whatever. 
for that LSU. It's whatever, it's got the Wallers yes. that they put up. Yep. And I don't know, it seems to work. I mean, I know it's not going to write a bicycle on cobblestones. But, yes. Um, but I was wondering if any that sort of there's, I think there's there's two or three pieces to it. One is the physical layout. So part of it's using bollards, right? So which we, we definitely started the process of examining that with land works. The other is is you know the, the bumpy nature of Fane Hall. So the cobblestones, you know, you have to, when you walk through Fane Hall, you have to sort of look down because you've got the cobblestones, right? So the cobblestones make it a little uncomfortable to walk if you can smooth that out a little bit. But the beauty of the cobblestones is it's not really possible to skateboard through there on the cobblestones. And it's uncomfortable to ride a bike, I think, as well. So um, some version of that sort of you know, bumpy paving, certainly in the beginning, I think prevents you know, bikers and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and skateboarders there. Because this open, I mean, this beautiful open. Yeah, and, you, you want know, it open. And I can see people just thinking this is their little and not the yeah. walking little I agree. I'd say the second piece is yeah. you, know, you, you want to make sure that it's sort of uh, policed well. You, know, yeah. you, know, you yeah. don't want to have. It's not like we want to have a bunch of securities, but, no, but to the extent that there are uh, skateboarders that show up, you want to make sure that there's an immediate reaction to say, folks, you got to, you know, you know. So, so I think that's a, the second piece as well that, that happens. Um, but the first is design, which we, we've, we've just started extensively to, to work, the, the work the landlords people into our regular meeting schedule to, to go through the work so, But that's definitely key for us. I have a follow-up on that, too, is uh, number one, Well, we'll follow the BTD guidelines around bike paths. Remember, so so the, the streets initiative that BTD began a year or two ago, we'll follow those same guidelines, which will involve bike paths. Yes. And the reason I bring that up is when some of the people that are going to be working there, that are going to be taking their bikes and leaving them in the garage, yes. they'll have to be some way to make sure that they're directed there and not just come in all different ways. Yeah, so. so you, you, you know what I mean? The ones that are going to do it every day, that are going to You've dedicated a lot of space in the garage for a bicycle. So, yeah, so it's, not, it's not just the hubway. Yeah, so what, what David's remembering, just for everybody, just to remind everybody, is this is a this is a bike storage area for 800 bikes. 850 bikes. We say that again, 850 bikes. That's a lot of bikes. So we're proud of it. We like it. But I agree with you. You know, we, we for example, we think of this as being a retail facility dedicated to bikes, bike repair you know, bike equipment, things like that. So we, we think, you know, that's one piece um, so that people can have a place for, you know, getting air in their tires and all you know, those basic things. Uh, but also, you know, we've thought through a lot as to how the bikes are going to enter. And so we're, you know, we're working through how the entrance to the garage will work, which way they'll go, what the uh, what the path needs to be for people biking, you know, to the spot in the basis. So a lot of folks who are biking might also be residents of the entire complex too. You know, so I, was it's not about, I was always concerned about the bikes not being seen by the cars. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's a, not just pedestrians, but you're concerned yeah. about the delivery trucks and the cars. And yes, yes, I agree. You've got the whole mix. We've got a whole mix of, we've got and delivery you, trucks. The thing that's, we had a meeting in the pad on things. The thing that scares the people the most about the bicycle is because you don't hear them. Yeah. So that's why I agree. there's so much I was walking across Congress Street, coming. I think I said this last meeting. The, uh, walking across Congress Street, and uh, the light was good, you know, flashing. Pedestrian, go ahead. And a biker went right through, nearly hit me. And uh, they don't care. They don't care. So, I, I, I um, these issues we've spent a ton of time on. So, the, so we've, we've, you know, we're working. This, this building is our first building. Right. So the building that in which we have kind of the most mature set of thoughts is, is this building in terms of delivery where we are, how it's going to work with this exit ramp, uh, thinking about this corner, and obviously we've said this before, at the end of the day, this corner on, on the stairs leading down to Barker Street becomes a really important corner um, for that piece. So, you know, we thought a lot about that. But then in addition to that, we've also talked about the fact that we don't want to just leave these parcel as it is for now while we do that first building. So, you know, so there's some smaller retail pieces that we think we can make happen on this on this parcel. So we're, we're already starting to implement we will already start to implement transportation changes on the East Parcel and start to give it a different feel for people so it's really not a, 
it's not a forgotten part of the city anymore. We want it to be a special part of the city. That, that's what, another thing that I was going to bring up with uh, the article eight. Where this project is being phased, it's going to take so long that a lot of us are concerned that when the other half of the garage is down, during the construction phasing, if you could even have some temporary buildings or yeah. something that uh, people can still be utilizing so it's not like a, you know, empty barrel. We definitely, we agree with you on that. So, you know, certainly this head house, I mean, we're going to be working with the MBTA to so replace the head house as quickly as, I mean, they're, they're going to push out us. We don't want a no man's land between the buses, the MBTA, and then the West Pass. Nor do we. So, we, you know, we've, we've begun a lot of the process. So remember, each of these buildings and each of these processes will be subject to an article 80. Not that you want to attend more meetings, because I know you have enough meetings. I just meant because it is going to take a long time. Yes, yeah, so, but, but when we get to that, that process of demolishing, yeah, there will be an article 80 process in which we will be presenting to you the specifics of what it is we'll do with the parcel. Here's the, here's the retail kiosks that we'll put. Here's, the, here's what we'll do for the temporary buildings. Or maybe we're coming to you saying we're going to build the east parcel. This is, this is what we're going to be doing to hear the buildings. Yes, sir. Uh, how many uh, stories will the office and residential tower? So the office tower at 528 is. The office tower, how many stories? Approximately 45 stories for the office tower. The residential tower at 480, probably. 40. Yeah. 40 40. 42, so 42 stories. And uh, the second question, uh, I don't know if you're going to get to tonight or whether it's appropriate, but uh, can you give us some idea of uh, timing of the construction phasing? So we, we'd like to begin. as we can. Um, so, you know, we, we, it takes us probably uh, 12 months to design a building like that. So, so we'll probably be designing, you know, we, we, we kicked those folks off in the last two weeks. So they've just started. So 12 months from this month, we hope to be in a position to begin that first uh, residential building. There's an article 80 process for that. So more meetings, more design, all the rest of it. But then we also need to design it as well. The, um, and then we have an obligation to take the garage down. Now it is conceivable if we if we were to land a tenant for the office building that we would want to take the garage down as quickly as possible. The way the document reads uh, today is we must take the, the garage down uh, beginning no later than January of 2023. Like, uh, January of 2023. Okay, but we will be working to try and land a tenant for uh, this office building to try and take the garage down sooner, which I think everybody wants. Which means. We'd be, I heard you say you're from Longfellow Place, so you might want us to not build that office building for 50 years, but we're going to be working to try and build I'm it. So we <laughs> but we're going to, who knows, right? So the, so we, um, so we're, we're, we're um, but we're going to be uh, trying to build that office building as quickly as we can. But the obligation is there for us to, to take the garage down before we can occupy the office building. Victor, I wasn't going to make it to a meeting without you asking a question. I was, well, I was determined to feel the question. This is like it's, um, well, one is a, is a comment, and uh, well, I guess I can end it with a question. The extension of the green line uh, doesn't relieve uh, passenger crowding. It increases it. And uh, I guess the question would be whether the MBTA uh, has taken that into consideration, whether you've had any official response from the MBTA other than the casual uh, yes they've been looking at it we've spent a tremendous amount of time with the MBTA uh, working with them you know, as, as you know my friend Dino at DeFranco we've been working with on this and um, the MBTA has you know as, as you know uh, a, a very large staff internally that thinks through planning capacity and all those sorts of things uh, I think the MBTA would be the first ones to say that they'd love to have even more resources than they have today to, to be able to increase capacity, maybe at a, as fast a rate as they possibly could. But they tell us affirmatively that they have the capacity to manage this project. Having considered the extension of the green line, 
Oh, yeah. And the additional pass-through, because <coughs> that will draw. Yes. Okay. Um, back to the East Parcel and people waiting for, uh, uh, for buses, which I've asked about before. Um, I guess the only uh, new questions would be, what kind of cold weather protection for people waiting at the, uh, for the buses will there be? Will there be an awning coming over? Will there be any kind of an enclosure? Because so remember that the East Parcel, when completed, that building will cover the bus station it's similar, in a similar fashion to where the garage covers it today. Just looking to see if I have a slide on this. I'm not sure I do. But, but the building, this right, this this is the lobby of that building. So the building comes over here. I'm trying to trace it correctly. These are these. See these dots right here? These are actually the the uh, columns from that building. So the building itself will cover the bus station all the way down to about right there. So the bus station will be a covered area again. And in addition to that. We'll, we'll make it an improved bus station. So today, just as an example, it sounds like a simple thing, but it's really it's a kind of a key thing. There is today no provision for people to buy a Charlie card on the surface at that bus station. So if you're racing to make your bus and you don't have money for the bus, you have to either decide whether to buy your ticket from the bus driver or go down into the station to get your Charlie ticket. So you know we can put Charlie tickets there. We can do things electronically to make it possible for people to understand when the next bus is coming so they can maybe even Rather than having to sit at that at this spot, it's a nice day. They can sit here at the cafe and have a cup of coffee while they wait for the bus. Uh, in that case, it should be uh, the electronic signage in the plaza here. Oh yeah. So here's what I was saying Not before. I'm sorry if I didn't make myself clear, but I was saying what we're thinking through with Landmarks is see, this this headhouse offers a big opportunity to put the electronic signage right on that headhouse to do something really interesting with that about when the buses are coming. So you could put it uh, certainly here, you could put it here on this wall, maybe both, uh, and then also on, on the bus side as well. So it's, it really gives a great opportunity to do something forward thinking. And the T, you can see the T is starting to do more of this at different stations. And so we really want to incorporate that and take that to the next level. And the final question would be addressed to the Greenway Conservancy. Is the Greenway Conservancy satisfied with the results of the shadows? I can't speak for Linda, Linda uh, this year. So the question was, is the Greenway Conservancy satisfied with the results of the shadow study? I don't know. I'm just, I'm trying to process whether satisfied is the right word. I mean, we, we reviewed the proposals that they've made, the, uh, some of the reduction in height and reduced the shadow impacts of the park. Um, North End Park's at the hottest uh, in the whole Greenway. Some of the time, some, in some cases, some I think the analysis that we've done it will not impact adversely the plant material in the park with what's planted. Um, and on balance, uh, you know, we'll certainly participate in the RFOE reviews of the individual buildings and when they're designed because a lot of the fine tuning can address some of the shadow and wind impacts. But I think we believe they've done a, a, a rigorous job of, of the analysis to date and give us the level of detail that they're working at, which is at, at a very high level because um, it's still conceptual. We've also spent a lot of time with the friends of the North End Parks, so um, I think we've met with Nate Swain two or three times at least, yeah, and uh, and, and other group, uh, other folks in that group, and uh, and they've actually offered some really interesting comments and thoughts. Uh, we're actually going to be working with Nate. I don't think I can say anything publicly about this, but we're going to be working with Nate to make some improvements in the garage today that make it look a little bit nicer. Um, it's, it, as you know, he's a he's a pretty talented guy, so. Um, so, uh, but I think in general, I, I'm not sure I can speak for them, but the Friends of the North End Parks generally have been uh, pleased with the reduction in shadow, with the work that we've done. And just as Linda said, I think there's a feeling that those parks are the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, sun, uh, most hit by the sun later in the day and kind of need some relief, um, which is what people have said, um, so the shadow off is that. Remember too, by the way, the shadow moves. It's not like it goes there and stops, as my friend David Hancock said. It's not nu nuclear winter. It it's shadow, right? So it moves across and it's dynamic. It actually makes for an interesting end of the day experience of, of many of these parks, including, as 
a huge amount of shadow that puts the the uh, parks by the uh, aquarium in shadow at the end of the day, pretty much all summer. And it really makes for an interesting dynamic, uh, but it certainly doesn't make that park any less used. It's packed all summer. Tom, during demolition, uh, what happened to the parking lot? Did they So again, so when, when we get to that point, there will be an article 80 process. And as part of that process, we will have to file a formal tra traffic plan, you know, uh, uh, for when the trucks will arrive. So uh, we, will, we will have to work through a very specific uh, plan for where the trucks will wait when they're, you know, so they'll be just in time to run. Uh, I, I certainly cannot envision that it will be okay for them to simply wait idling on a you know. So we'll have to work through where they'll wait, how they'll get there, you know, walkie-talkies with folks to, to sort of call them in when it's time to call them in. So we'll try and be as, as efficient as possible. We actually have started to formulate a very detailed plan for how we're going to take the garage down. We, we uh, you know, it does, as I, as I said to you, it does involve kind of an organized disassemblement. It's not a demolition. Um, and, uh, and so we'll have some guy, and, and the whole team will be working to formally establish that. And we have to publish that again as part of the public process. And are you far enough advanced in, in thought about that to consider whether or not it will be done during an off garden season? You know, it's a TV garden right now, ramped up, it's 200 events going to happen between now and June. Um, and between June and unless it goes to playoffs, but let's say between June and October, there's not much going on. Mm. So that's a quieter time. It's a, okay, granted, the garden traffic, everybody says it's not until an hour before the event. Well, they have to get a lot earlier than that. <clears throat> yeah, I think we're going to have to take all of that into consideration. The, the entire process takes about nine or ten months. Yeah. So it's it's not possible to do it all just in the season when there's no garden traffic. No, so I can't yeah. promise that. Yeah. But I, we definitely are going to have to think through the, the how we're going to do it during garden events. I certainly would imagine that on the night of a a sizable garden event, a Rhodes game or Celtics game or whatever, that there's not work being done, right? So we'll have to shut down at a certain hour, you know, have things cleared and ready to go so that, it's, so that the traffic can flow as normally as possible. Um, so hopefully, you know, to the extent that we fall into those seasons, we'll work through how we're doing it relatively off hours. But we're also, and as you know, this has become fortunately a residential area, right? So, so we really cannot do the work, I don't think, off hours, fully off hours. So it's, we're going to have to do it during the course of the day and manage the best we can. This, has been a, this garage has been a 50-year problem for the city. And we're going to take it down. We're going to disassemble. We're going to do it. And I can't say it's not going to be without some daily disruption, but we're going to do the best we can. Well, I know just watching the green line get disassembled was uh, fascinating to watch. Mm -hmm. and Ten months. I mean, yeah. We've done this very specific. We've gone through our folks and counted yeah. the number of concrete tees and you know all those sorts of things. And we've you know we've gone through how long it takes us to remove that concrete tee, where it's going to go, how the trucks going to take it, all those different pieces. So you know as we've gone through that, we know with with, with some degree of certainty that it's going to take between nine and ten months. Right? So we, we feel pretty good about our, our knowledge base right now. Obviously, this is our front door. I agree with you. So, you know, we, we uh, I'm not going to put we 
Miguel in another spot, but we, we met and talked about this actually just, just last week. And uh, so we definitely uh, agree with you. you know, I think we're all going to have to work together. I think there's an element of uh, there's, some, there's some state uh, involvement that's going to be required. There's certainly some city involvement that's going to be required. There's neighborhood involvement, property owners, all those things to fix it. You know, we, it's taken us 20 years to get to the point where we, we now can publicly admit that those ramps cannot be easily built on. And so therefore, there's really not money to be made by the Turnpike Authority or the, or the NASDAQ people. So what it's going to require is a public investment of some sort to make some improvements. So, we'll I should say to take some of the, possibly some of the uh, demolished you know, We're working on all those whatever. pieces of ideas and all those things. Yeah. So. And some private investment too. Well, that's I forgot that the yeah. Senate President's yeah. office was here. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, only because the project's going to take so long. Yes. That you yeah. hate to see such an investment and then have an ugly eyesore right in front of you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I agree. I agree. Not to pile on, they've actually got to say the same thing. There'll be how many? Six, six or eight feet in diameter. Six or eight feet in diameter. How many drilled rather than drilled? Drilled, yeah. Drilled, drilled through. Yep. To the, because it's an existing garage that we're drilling down through. So it would be case on, oh, I, I, I would say not sooner than the fourth quarter of 2014. More likely the first quarter of 2015, I agree. It takes 12 months to design. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a big, complicated building. It's going to take a full 12 months to design. As much as we're going to be pounding on CBT to do it quicker, it'll take a full 12 months. They'll want a contract, they'll want a contract that says 15 months. <laughs> Talking about not having a lot of noise at night because of the residents. But 
some of your closer adjacent uh, butters and so forth, yeah. the biggest problem sometimes is not just the noise, it's the vibration. Yeah. yeah. Causing yeah. damage to other buildings nearby. Because some of the other buildings are old, so the vibrations yeah. cause more. Yeah, no, most again, most projects again are required to have a detailed vibration monitoring plan and if there is power driving. Yeah. Um, and vibration is not supposed to leave the site. And, and construction companies have gotten really good at this. Um, People hear sound a lot more than they feel the vibrations at the end of the day. But with that said, too, I mean, this, these are still typical urban projects that, you know, there are a lot of projects that are built in the city of Boston that are, first of all, directly across from residential projects or other existing office buildings. The Avenir went up, you know, Victor just finished up in the Bullfinch Triangle. There are a lot of other projects that, so this is not an atypical condition, but. Yeah, these, um, these are, uh, there's a lot more complicated work that's been done. I mean, the, the work to build those buildings that Doug just suggested over the tunnels and through the, you know, there's... I already mentioned it because it's interesting. A lot of people, have, like during the big dig, a lot of the people in the North End, believe it or not, we're having more problem with vibration than noise, yeah. even if they live farther away from the yeah. Sometimes it was just considered thinking it was worse than it might have been, but to them it was a major concern at the time. Yeah. Um, when does the article 80 process start for the first building? You know, we're, we're working right now on the filing, so I, I would anticipate that we would file, you know, we could file as soon as January, um, uh, at least in that time frame, January, February, somewhere. So then we'll kick that in and that will go, that probably takes, you know, through to the early part of the spring. So we're on a 15 year the IMG. Right, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I was just thinking as we're going in here, we haven't fed you guys in a while. We should feed the IMG. We, you guys have been so good with us, man. So we're going to do that next time around. We should, right? I know. Can I have a pizza party or something? Okay, any other questions? Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Post. Thank you. Remember, November 6th is the end of the comment period. If you haven't, please grab the uh, agenda or sign in if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you.